is one of the least known stories in American history. It is the story of black achievement and accomplishment. Against all odds, American blacks have built their own institutions, families, schools, churches, and businesses. Against all odds, American blacks have created great art and science, fought heroically in every American war. Against all odds, black men and women have worked endlessly to secure their own freedom and equality. The untold story of blacks in America is a 350-year saga of incredible achievements. This is that story. Hello, I'm James Avery, and welcome to a history of black achievement in America. Now, the 18 years covered in episode three were the years of greatest dramatic change for black America. During this period, the ugly face of enslavement was exposed. Blacks joined the Union in fighting for their own freedom in a civil war that almost tore the country apart. And they became citizens for the first time, earned the right to vote. Now, if that weren't enough, Again for the first time, black women joined with white women to create a powerful new social force in the country, the women's movement. And finally, parallel black institutions of church, school, and most importantly, family, flourished in every part of the nation. In the second half of the 19th century, these vibrant institutions empowered blacks to new levels of achievement in all walks of life and they empowered blacks to push the nation toward eventual equality, starting with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution. Now, during the middle of the 19th century, no woman was a greater inspiration for the poor and the disadvantaged than the former slave Sojourner Truth. For the first time in American history, she, along with Harriet Beecher Stowe and her book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, elevated a reform movement into a national debate. Prior to the Civil War, Sojourner Truth was the most powerful voice for two reform movements, abolition and women's rights. She was an ex-slave, a fiery abolitionist, and a spellbinding singer and a riveting preacher who dazzled listeners with her wit and originality. Born in 1797, Truth transformed herself from a domestic servant named Isabella into a Pentecostal preacher whose words of empowerment have inspired black women and poor people the world over. Her most famous speech her Ain't I a Woman speech, was given at the 1851 Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio. After several male speakers claimed man's superiority over women, including superior intellect, Sojourner Truth rose from the audience. Well, children, where there is so much racket, there must be something out of kilter. I think between the Negroes in the South and the women in the North all talking about rights. That white man's gonna be in a fix pretty soon. And what's all this talking about? That man over there says that women should be helped out of carriages and lifted over ditches and shown the best place everywhere. Nobody showed me any best place. And ain't I a woman? Look at me, look at my arm. I have plowed and I have planted and gathered into barns and no man could head me. And ain't I a woman? I can work as hard and eat as much as any man when I could get it and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? I have borne children and seen most of them sold into slavery. And when I cried 
out with a mother's grief. None but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? The crowd broke out in cheers. Following this great speech, Truth moved to Michigan in 1857. Then after the Emancipation Proclamation, she moved to Washington, D.C., even meeting with Abraham Lincoln in the White House. Finally, she returned to her home in Battle Creek, Michigan, where she died in 1883, having left a most remarkable legacy. If blacks were to achieve equality, they would need to have the best possible education. Now, perhaps the greatest story of black accomplishment in the 19th century is how blacks, barred from white schools, took up the challenge of educating their own. They would have to produce their own scientists, inventors, educators, lawyers, doctors, and physicians. <laughs> and they did. In the 21st century, black professionals are a common part of the fabric of American life. From medicine to business, from entertainment to teaching, blacks share in the country's standard of living, the highest standard of living on the planet. In addition, the black middle class has expanded during the second half of the 20th century. All of this because of the courage and foresight of many unknown and unheralded blacks in the middle of the 19th century. From the earliest days of the new nation, enlightened citizens knew the only way to liberty, equality, and true democracy was education for all. And for a long time, blacks had to supply that opportunity for themselves. Denied entry into white schools, they sought basic schooling through alternative avenues. Then in 1854, near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Lincoln University opened its doors, still growing today with its new motto, producing leaders to shape a new millennium. It would be the first of many black colleges and universities. In the four decades following emancipation and the end of the Civil War, and without access to great financial resources, blacks amassed and contributed more than $40 million for the education of their children. By 1900, there were 28,500 black teachers, 1.5 million black children in schools, and 34 black colleges and universities. In the 20th century, the pace of black higher education accelerated even more. As for Lincoln University, during the school's first century, its graduates made up 20% of all black doctors and 10% of all lawyers. Its alumni include Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall and literary giant Langston Hughes. In truly American fashion, blacks, through their own hard work, have become scientists, educators, lawyers, and doctors as Lincoln University's motto states, shaping the new millennium. Justice Joseph Cinque, who led the rebellion on the slave ship Amistad, put a face on the horrors of the slave trade in 1839. Frederick Douglass put a face on the horrors of enslavement in America. Not only did he do this, but also for the first time in literature, he gave a personal account of what it meant to be black in America. For most Americans, the horrors of slavery were only an abstract evil. But one man, an ex-slave who escaped this brutality, wrote a stunning account of his life as a slave and his subsequent escape to freedom. Frederick Douglass was that man. And in telling his story, he did more than put a face on enslavement. He gave to American literature a story that would speak through the ages. It was Douglas's autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom, published in 1855. Many blacks, such as Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, 
than Henry Highland Garnet, spoke out against enslavement. White authors such as William Lloyd Garrison and Harriet Beecher Stowe describe the degradation of bondage through lurid tales of whippings, brandings, and the separation of families. However, it was Douglas's personal account on the printed page that created the extraordinary emotion in his readers necessary to bring enslavement to an end. In writing about his overseer, a man named Covey, and a team of oxen Douglas was to break, Douglas described the dark soul of enslavement in this short but eloquent passage. I now saw in my situation several points of similarity with that of the oxen. They were property. So was I. They were to be broken. So was I. Kobe was to break me. I was to break them. Break and be broken. Such is life. His flight to freedom was equally to the point in moving. The flight was a bold and perilous one. But here I am in the great city of New York, safe and sound, without loss of blood or bone. In less than a week after leaving Baltimore, I was walking among the hurrying throng and gazing upon the dazzling wonders of Broadway. The dreams of my childhood and the purposes of my manhood were now fulfilled. A free state around me and a free earth under my feet. What a moment this was to me. A whole year was pressed into a single day. A new world burst upon my agitated vision. In the years following the Civil War, Douglas worked tirelessly for the rights of blacks. But his greatest legacy was his writing, which opened a new world of black literary expression. My bondage and my freedom would be echoed in future generations by writers like James Baldwin, Ralph Ellison, Amiri Baraka, Langston Hughes, Gwendolyn Brooks, and Maya Angelou. In the final four segments, we shall see how the nation moved in eight years from the decision by the U.S. Supreme Court confirming that blacks were property to three amendments to the Constitution ending enslavement once and for all. From 1820 to 1861, every political decision on enslavement made by the federal government expanded the rift between North and South. At the core of the rift was, would the United States remain an indivisible union or become two nations? And were blacks citizens or property? Even the great victory in the Mexican-American War of 1846 heightened the debate. Would the conquered territory be free or slave? Then in 1857, a pro-slavery Supreme Court made a decision that all but guaranteed Lincoln's assent to the presidency and the settling of the rift by war. It was the infamous Dred Scott decision. It started when Dred Scott, a slave living in Missouri, was sold to an army surgeon, Dr. John Emerson. From 1830 to 1842, Scott and his family accompanied the surgeon to postings in Illinois and Wisconsin, northern states declared free by the Missouri Compromise of 1820. Four years after returning to Missouri, Scott wanted to be free. Rather than escaping, he heroically decided to sue for his freedom. He said that since he and his wife had lived in free states for 12 years, he was now entitled to freedom as a United States citizen. Eleven years later, in 1857, the historic case reached the Supreme Court. Chief Justice Rajatani, writing for the majority, stated Scott must remain a slave and that as a slave he was property, not a citizen of the United States 
and therefore he never had been free. Tani went on to say, since slaves were property, and the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution guaranteed that no citizen should be deprived of property without due process of law, Congress had no right to forbid slaveholding. The Missouri Compromise of 1820 was therefore void. Within four years, the North and South would be at war. Ironically, the war Dred Scott helped to trigger, he would never live to see. However, he died a free man, for shortly after the court's decision, his legal benefactors purchased his freedom. The war between the states, the war between the North and South, which started in April 1861, had been going badly for the Union armies. For nearly a year and a half, the North had suffered many defeats. England and France were on the verge of recognizing the South's independence, and morale among Union troops and civilians was very low. Lincoln needed to do something. During the summer of 1862, he contemplated issuing a decree freeing the slaves. Oddly for Lincoln, the war was not about slavery, a problem which had plagued the United States since its inception. For Lincoln, the war was about preserving the Union. Lincoln wrote to newspaper editor Horace Greeley on August 22, 1862. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could do it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. Nevertheless, at the same time, Lincoln was working on a draft of the proclamation that began. All persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then thenceforward and forever free. Lincoln knew this would rally the abolitionists in the North. By not freeing the slaves in the border states, but only in the South, the proclamation would not directly upset the slaveholders who had stayed with the Union. It would also impede recognition of an independent South by the rest of the world. But Lincoln needed a victory by Union forces before he could unveil his secret proclamation. On September 17, 1862, Northern armies under General McClellan stopped a drive north by Lee's army in Maryland. The Battle of Antietam turned out to be the bloodiest conflict in U.S. history. In all, 26,000 men died. Five days later, Lincoln issued a preliminary proclamation freeing the slaves. The war would now be about slavery. In fact, the outcome of the war was no longer in doubt the North would win. On January 1st, 1863, a final version of the Emancipation Proclamation was issued. Ironically, no slaves were actually freed. It took the 13th Amendment, passed on December 18th, 1865, to accomplish the new goal of Lincoln's War. Nothing would be spared in the fight for their freedom was the tagline from the 1989 Hollywood movie, Glory. It told the story of an all-black regiment during the Civil War, a regiment that in reality was the all-volunteer 54th Massachusetts Regiment that led the assault on South Carolina's Fort Wagner. It was the crowning moment in the black soldiers' valiant fight for their own freedom. Just like George Washington in 1776, Abraham Lincoln at first refused to allow black soldiers in the Union Army. And just like Washington, Lincoln decided at the war's lowest moment to allow blacks to serve the nation. He did so at the time of his famous Emancipation Proclamation, at a time when the Union needed an infusion of new fighting men. 
Once in uniform, black soldiers were again among the best the nation had to offer. Union General James Blunt declared about his black troops, I never saw such fighting as was done by the Negro Regiment. The question that Negroes will fight is settled. Besides, they make better soldiers in every respect than any troops I have ever had under my command. By the war's end, 186,000 blacks served in more than 163 units, 13% of the Union Army. In addition, 30,000 blacks served in the Navy. In all, 37,000 black soldiers died during the course of the Civil War. But the most celebrated battle fought by black troops was the assault on Fort Wagner, South Carolina on July 18, 1863. Commanded by Colonel Robert Shaw, a white man, and led by Sergeant William Carney, a black man, it was one of the bloodiest battles of the Civil War. Shaw himself wanted to lead the charge, had talked earlier about having a premonition of going into battle and, um, um, you know, maybe meeting his fate and that sort of thing, uh, which he did. He led the charge, um, and uh, when he went down, uh, the standard bearer carrying the flag uh, of the unit went down uh, as well, uh, and a black soldier, William Carney, uh, picked it up and carried it through. and said that uh, it never touched the ground, uh, even though he uh, was injured uh, in the assault, um, but brought it back. Um, and while the assault itself was not uh, successful in military terms, it's tremendously important for continuing valor of black soldiers in combat, often thought not to be courageous enough. The idea was that uh, Negroes were very cowardly. And so Kearney stands as a great testament to the courage and bravery of black soldiers. The heroics of these soldiers convinced President Lincoln that blacks were reliable soldiers and would be willing to fight without reservation for the Union Army. Sergeant Kearney's famous flag, the flag that never touched the ground, is still preserved in Boston. Later, William Carney was the first black soldier to be awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. After the war, four new black regiments continued to serve on the Western frontier, including the 9th and 10th Cavalry, the famous Buffalo Soldiers. In the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson spoke of the natural rights of all men, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Eleven years later, the United States Constitution was written to secure those blessings of liberty. Yet the Constitution and the Bill of Rights which followed denied the vote to all non-whites and all women. In fact, blacks were considered three-fifths of a person. Finally, a war would be fought, the Civil War, which would later be described as a war to end slavery. However, to make this promise a reality, abolitionists such as Frederick Douglass worked tirelessly with radical Republican leaders Charles Sumner and Thaddeus Stevens to correct the errors of the nation's founding fathers by adding three momentous amendments to the Constitution. Thirteenth Amendment, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Fourteenth Amendment. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of a citizen of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of the law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws.
Fifteenth Amendment. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. In the next episode of A History of Black Achievement in America, Black's newfound freedom releases an explosion of creative energy and accomplishment. I'm James Avery. Thanks for watching.